Good morning, everyone. This is a John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. I am your host, Franklin Hu. Today is May 2nd, uh, 2020. So let's see who we have on the chat today. We have we have James, uh, we have Dennis, we have Roger, we have Ian, uh, we have Bill, and we also got Carl. If I can't put him on the screen, um, so welcome everyone. Let's see here. So today, I believe James has a, uh, a presentation he would like to give us. So uh, you want to go ahead with that, James? Have to unmute yourself. Yeah, you got I, I'm going to uh, go to full screen now because I have a slideshow. Yes, go ahead, uh, share your screen, and then we'll. I'm going to full screen. Screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. Uh, share screen, share screen. Uh -huh. Share. Now, slideshow. Okay, I've got your sharing. There, now, okay. I have the slideshow there. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it now. Well, well okay, so, should I start talking away here? Yep, yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay, um, thanks to some inputs from Dennis Allen, I've worked on inertial propulsion mechanism and its demonstration. Inertial propulsion may be described as conversion of angular momentum to linear momentum, thus violating Newton's mechanics in which these variables are separately conserved, separately conserved. And I refer you to a great book by Dennis Allen on um, Gucci, uh, Guccian mechanics. For example, Eric Le Lathwaite, who we discussed a week or so ago, and others have demonstrated translation motion of a gyro only when spinning called precession as well as apparent levitation. Unlike Newton's mechanics, the time development laws of binary mechanics do not specifically require separate conservation of angular and linear momentum. Uh, I, I realized this, or, or this came to my attention, is a, perhaps a better way to put, put, put it, after the inputs from uh, Dr. Allen. However, energy, one state bits called quanta, is conserved in binary mechanics. In fact, the time development laws of binary mechanics use quantum motion alternating routinely between circular motion and translation and are the mechanism of inertial propulsion. Now, this uh, little thing on the screen that covers up the bottom of my slide, uh, it says that the, I think it says the binary mechanics lab simulator was used to demonstrate several of these effects. Now, in order to understand the data I'm going to show you, you have to realize a little bit about the spot cube uh, it's, uh, and the spatial model of binary mechanics, which is a lattice of spot cubes. And there are eight spots in the spot cube. And here's the other side showing the uh, positron spot at 0, 0, 0, and the electron spot at coordinate, spot coordinate 1, 1, 1. And these are quarks, both matter and, and antimatter. Now, the thing that I want to bring to your attention, even if you're not totally familiar with this, is that the direction of motion, which my slides are going to show, is going in a negative direction. In other words, toward the, the positron spot. Okay, so let's go on here. Now, here is the spaghetti of the proton bit cycle discovered in, in 2011 where the laws of binary mechanics indicate that quanta follow this path. The uh, yellow uh, uh, loop here is the electron bit cycle, and all the rest of the spaghetti is the proton, much more complex proton bit cycle. The purple arrows indicate the strong bit operation where a quanta moving, let's say, from this coordinate to here, here, here to here, uh, through the strong bit operation, changes direction, and then is going to be going in this direction uh, in the next uh, simulator cycle. 
So this, this is a little bit, uh, and, and it's important to realize that Y is zero, and in other words, a smaller coordinate value, and, and then the down here is a, a higher coordinate value, which is the reverse of what's seen in most situations, just to alert you to that fact. Now, here we have the circular motion that I showed in the yellow loop in the previous slide of the electron bit cycle. Bits here uh, in over three simulator ticks will circulate like this forever and ever. However, certain conditions will cause a bit to leave the uh, a quanta, uh, defined again as a one state bit because the uh, a location like this uh, is one location, this is another location and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Certain conditions will cause a quanta to leave this circular uh, motion. By the way, the axis of this motion, the gray circle, is the solid diagonal between the electron spot and the positron spot on the other side, which we can't see. The black arrows, a one state quanta, leaves the circular motion. Now, uh, we can look at this in terms of here are the coordinate positions of bit loci for the electron spot. And we're going to look at the, the L-type bits uh, designated here, uh, which I have called photon bits, in the uh, left-handed electron spot. And here are the, the coordinates. There are three of them that are relevant. Now, after the translation that I just showed you, after these translations, the black arrows here, here is the new position of the quanta. And so the difference there gives you the motion, the P vector here. <coughs> if we sum these P vectors, you notice that the sum is in the negative direction. In other words, there's a directionality in the translation. Uh, when a quanta leaves the circular motion uh, exhibiting angular momentum, which, by the way, was used to derive in 2015 Planck's constant uh, concerning intrinsic electron spin. So here is the sum of the vectors of the three black arrows I just showed you, and they're all in the negative direction here, which means uh, going toward the electron spot, generally speak, excuse me, going toward the positron spot, uh, which is uh, uh, the gray item I showed you in the spot cube previously. Now, let's go here. Oh, boy, this one, do, do not faint. <laughs> here we have some arrows added to the purple arrows I pre previously showed you in the, pro in the much more complex proton bit cycle. <laughs> which contains seven spots, whereas the electron bit cycle shown here previously, and here we depict again the black arrows that I showed you in a different schematic before, but it's the same deal for the electron spot shown in ye yellow. So there are 17, uh, excuse me, there are seven spot uh, uh, spots in the proton bit cycle. So here we go, the bit locus coordinates omit the commas. For example, one zero three is one comma zero comma three. Those are the coordinates. Now the purple arrows are the strong bit operation, as I indicated before. The orange arrows are phase change within the proton bit cycle. This is an extremely important thing. You notice that here. Let's take an orange arrow right here. Okay, this orange arrow. In if at this point three one one at this bit locus, 311, instead of the strong bit operation, uh, uh, move, moving the quanta up to 301, <coughs> if the strong operation is blocked, the uh, orange arrow here will have the 311 mm. quanta move to 312, which is another portion of the same proton bit cycle. In other words, we have a phase change of the quanta within the proton bit cycle. Follow my red indicator here. Without that phase change, we'd have to go up here, over here, down here, over here, back up over here, back over to 302, and then down to 3112. But this orange arrow here allows a jump 
in the uh, change of, I'm calling it a change of phase, in the position of quanta within a particular proto <coughs> proton bit cycle. The other arrow, uh, orange arrows here show exactly the same thing. So that if you're watching this in the video, you, you can pause the video here and look at the other, other orange arrows and see that they repeat exactly what I just said. Now, the purple and the orange arrows are the basis for color Ooh. confinement, uh, which is uh, now explained by binary mechanics, of course. Quantum uh, chromodynamics is for the last century. That's pr pretty much a history book uh, type of thing. It's not really relevant to particle physics today. Now, the black arrows, are the, as I said before, are the uh, uh, quanta exiting the electron cycle. The gray arrows are positron exit accounts for net proton translation, as we're going to see in a table in just a moment. The blue and the gray arrows, all of these blue and the uh, gray arrows, which are coming from posit spot units within po positron spots, and here's the other one, all three of them, <coughs> involve exit from the proton bit cycle. In other words, the circular motion in the proton bit cycle <coughs> is turned into a linear translation uh, motion. Now that's a little bit redundant to use all those three three terms in one in, in one phrase, but I'm just trying to emphasize we're going from a circular angular momentum situation to a linear situation in all of these black blue and gray arrows it's a transition from one bit cycle oh i left out the c there to another the mechanism for all particle motion and in other words it's a big deal for people to be talking about in particle physics particle motion how fast they go in accelerators how close to the speed of light they are and all these sorts of things and yet nobody has told us how particles move i just did going from one bit cycle to another. That's the mechanism for what all this talk about particle motion is. This is what, according to binary mechanics, is actually occurring. Now, let's look at, I showed you the electron table, which is rather simpler. And I've color coded, but this table is the same thing for the proton um, bit cycle. Uh, and it's the AI are the uh, is the positional uh, uh, along the solid diagonal spin axis, <coughs> which uh, is orthogonal to the position of the quant quanta at zero to three, for example. And uh, the uh, motion is here, and then the difference is here. And these color codes of the orange here are the same as the orange arrows in the previous slide, as well as the gray highlights here show the uh, positron uh, translational uh, uh, vector, the, the P vector here, uh, <clears throat> for the positron. You notice the sum of all of these, the column sums here, is minus one, minus one, minus one again, just exactly what we had for the electron. And bingo, look, the, the positron uh, translations here are the ones responsible for this net result. All the um, orange translations cancel out. You got a minus one here, and let's see. Oh, look, there's a plus one there. You got a minus one here, and let's see. Oh, there's a plus one there, and so forth. The, so the orange ones cancel out. Remember, the orange ones were the change of phase within a proton bit cycle, very, very important for gy gyroscopes and so forth, as we're going to see. And now we uh, can summarize a, a basic principle. It is the leptons, the positron spot and the electron spot, which are involved in the precession that occurs or the uh, translational motion that occurs when a quanta exits a uh, loop cycle and to move on to another bit cycle. Okay, now here's my. Uh, now we're going to do some experiments. Okay, just, just like Lathe <laughs> Wade did in his wonderful video. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I think I may have the the, the virus. <coughs> okay, uh, here is the control data for two runs of the binary mechanical 
lab simulator, BMLS, and here are the ticks. Each BMLS tick is the application of the four-bit operation, which are the laws of time development in binary mechanics, to the system state. The system state was a randomly chosen seeding of a volume uh, with one state bits at a density of 0.25. Uh, in other words, each bit locus had a chance of about 25% to, to uh, be in the one state in the randomized initial seeding of the uh, simulated volume. We, we see a, a, a little spike here at the beginning, but notice how we move in the negative direction. Here we're subtracting the bottom uh, minus the top. So if the top has more, um, we're going in a negative direction, okay? Like, you know, like zero minus one gives you minus one, right? So if there are more uh, one state quanta in the upper portion uh, along the y-axis of the <coughs> simulated volume, this number is going to look like it's negative. Now, I'm, I, I was using these in two runs, control one and control two, and so designated. And look what happens. After a period of time, we come down to a relatively stable uh, situation where quanta have moved up. In other words, uh, in a negative coordinate or a decrease in, in, in coordinate value uh, as shown here. So th that's our controls. <coughs> By the way, that is precession. Now, I, this I just put in here to remind you of the the general coordinates of the, the uh, positron spot is in the zero location, and the biggest coordinate here, uh, these are spot coordinates, not bit loci co coordinates. Um, the electron is in the greatest situation, and the diagonal between this point, the solid dot cube diagonal between this point and this point is the axis of spin for both the proton and the electron. Just to remind you. Now, if we tilt the uh, view of the spot cube, this face here is what is sort of displayed <coughs> in the uh, simulator display. And again, you notice that the upper level, the second one here is zero, second one here is zero, that's your y-axis, okay? And then here the y-axis is one, one. So lower y-axis has a larger number than the upper. This is just to help orient you to the data. Now, what did I do? I filled this with uh, uh, additional L-type bits, which previous research has shown is uh, are, are related to momentum representation because the system state in binary mechanics represents both momentum and position simultaneously <coughs> beats the uh, uh, quantum, the, the legacy quantum mechanic system states, which can only show one position or momentum uh, separately. Uh, so we have a superior representation of the system state in binary mechanics. Now, in what I just showed you, let's uh, remind you because I added these little comp pre previous. Okay, remember, see up here is, is the smaller coordinate and down here, the larger Y coordinate. So that's the top and here's the bottom. In this gray area space, we filled this with quanta. Now, if we roll this over, so we have an XZ view, looking down on, on it, I added L bits pointing this way in this rectangular area of our wheel that we're going to create. And in this rectangular area, arrow uh, L bits are arrows pointing down, arrows pointing to the right, arrows pointing up in these two uh, quad, quad quadrants. So in each quad quadrant, we have a mixture of two directions in, shown in the top view. So here we're trying to create a gy gyro wheel to, sit, to, to simulate stuff. Okay, here's what we get. The experimental, the control. Remember I showed you two controls, control one and control two. <coughs> and we have the left, uh, what I showed you in the last slide. Uh, let's go back. 
I'm calling this the left, going counterclockwise. So the counterclockwise one is the dark blue plot. And you notice what happens after about exactly 37 ticks, subtracting the output from the left experimental condition, where we're adding the bits as I just showed you to create the wheel, the gyro wheel, uh, mi minus the control, you know, so we can sort out the effect of adding our gyro wheel uh, from what the effect we already saw of the control by itself. We notice that after about 37 ticks, we have a step down and a further step down. Now notice the initial state for left and also right here um, is the injection of these bits at tick zero. And just like uh, uh, for the physical gyro, something uh, like like a power drill or something, uh, it, uh, someone just spinning the wheel, some energy is required to s start the gyro spinning. And that's like the injection of the bits that we did. And we see after 37 ticks, we get some translation in what direction? Toward the positron side. <coughs> Oh, excuse me more, uh, going down and then a further step down, it seems, and the two different. Uh, so what if we did the right wheel? Maybe the direction of spin matters. How about that? In the lathe uh, weight demonstrations, uh, he didn't really say which direction the wheel was spinning. Well, let's spin. Let's take that uh, uh, graph, that, that gra graphic that I just showed you here and reverse the arrow. So instead of having it spin left or counterclockwise, let's reverse the arrows and have it spin right and see if that makes a difference. Whoops, here's the right curve. And remember, this is just one trial of experimental versus control con con conditions. By the way, uh, why is this the control condition that goes with each the left and the right? Well, those are two different random seedings, which were saved and used uh, again to create the uh, first to look at what the control situation was and then what the left and the right situation was. Okay, this is what experimental work actually involves, this sort of thing. And we see that the two curves are approximately similar. It doesn't seem to matter which direction, left or right, the wheel is spinning. Oh my God, what kind of a problem do we have here? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, this is the next slide. Now, let's see. Uh, I, I, am I lost? What, what's the difference here? Experimental minus control. Let's go back. Experimental. And I'm not now. Now I'm not sure what what this next slide is here. It sort of looks like almost the same thing. Let's move on. So we have actually. Um, what if we just average these? Curve. Oh, oh, ah, uh, you know what that slide was. Uh, please, please ex excuse me. <clears throat> this is left, right for the second control. So we had the first uh, r r random seating, this one, it looks very pre pretty, doesn't it? And then uh, next, <coughs> the second C seating, left, right with the second control. That's what's missing here. I should have put two there. <coughs> Now, what? Oh, so we've got four curves. Let's just average the four curves and see what we get. This is what we get. It doesn't matter. It appears to, to matter a great deal whether the wheel is spinning to the right or to the left. We get a period of time where we have translation uh, in the upward toward the top direction indicated by the minus coordinate change here. <coughs> <coughs> which peters out after a period of time because the gyro wheel will will slow down. And, you know, ju ju just like in, in the experiments of lathe work or anyone spinning a, a, bicycle, a, a bicycle wheel or whatever. Now, what about a nun? No, okay, the previous data I showed you was the wheels left and right. None designates we're going to add the same number of L-type quanta, but none refers to, they could be anywhere in that area of the wheel. Uh, in other words, uh, not neatly packed the way I showed you in the schematic before. 
And guess what? We get about the same thing. So it doesn't even matter where you put the quanta. It's the number of the L-type bit quanta that you put in the space, which seems to determine the amount of deflection. Now, remember, when we had the control one and the control two before, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we saw a downward motion, a, that sort of a precession or translation. This downward motion is in addition to what we saw. Okay, next slide. And we're almost done. Well, this is it. This is the last slide. I'm sorry there's not a whole, whole lot more, but this is it. This report provides further emphasis, example, that the binary mechanic time development laws produce quantum motion alternating routinely between circular motion in electron and proton bit cycles and translation in quantum motion from one cycle to another, which of course is the basis for all and mechanism for all particle motion, uh, well, in the universe, according to binary mechanics. In brief, these laws are the mechanism of inertial pro propulsion and have precise mathematical definition as, as uh, set forth in, in the paper of fundamental forces. Basically, you need to know binary logic in order to understand the forces of nature. The binary mechanics lab simulator was used to demonstrate several translation precession effects. Specifically, gyro device precession appears to result from synchronization of circular motion of quantum yeah. in multiple bit cycles. Now, synchronization, when we are initial state at tick BMLS tick zero, well, all of those L bits that we've added uh, to create circular motion are synchronized. They're put in all at once, much like we put our hand on the wheel and spin it. That force is, or, or, or that effect is saying synchronized in that motion in that point in time. And then the greater the gyro device size, well, the more cycles are synchronized, the greater the gyro device size and its precession. It's about that simple. <coughs> Excuse me. The binary mechanic model of space, spot cube lattice, specifies, oh, this is the biggie. The binary model, mechanics model of space, spot cube latest, specifies a fixed direction reference, the bit cycle spin axis. If this anisotropy is confirmed by observation and experiment, science will have an absolute spatial reference. Think about it. The direction in the binary mechanics model of this latest spot cube latest of perceptions, the average direction are summed up. Remember, I showed you the three minus ones in, in the vectors for both the electron and the positron uh, bit cycles. That direction would appear to be uh, what do you what would you call 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 that? A fixed reference or a fixed direction. And presumably we can do experiments or make some observations to determine what that direction is at any particular time. That's a very exciting pro prospect, an absolute direction. If that were demonstrated, that would be a major mega um, support for binary mechanics postulates. Oh, okay, so that's my um, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Now, uh, should I, I'm gonna leave this uh, the slideshow up for a moment in case there are questions or discussions about it so I could quick, quickly go from one slide to another. End of story. Franklin, take over. Okay, well, let's open things up for discussion here. So I guess I have a few questions. This, the presentation wasn't really quite what I was expecting. Uh, I mean, the basic problem here I was expecting to discuss was this question of inertial propulsion, which is if you have your satellite and if it's falling out of orbit, <clears throat> then theoretically the inertial propulsion uh, can be used to boost the satellite back up into orbit so that it doesn't fall fall out. So that I think we had discussed, you know, that was one of the uh, practical applications of if you could if you could do that. Well, so, if, uh, if if the gyro is 
Uh -huh. If the gyro is, or, is all organized so that the translational motion I described is away from Earth, that would be your uh, 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 inertial propulsion applied in that situation. So in other words, my presentation here about uh, translating circular motion into uh, translational motion um, is general. It applies to all situations with John. Well, does that lead us to some kind of, you know, how do we do this? This is what's confusing me because uh, bit mechanics works on basically, you know, the uh, uh, atomic level, I, I would take it, right? So, so uh, uh, a, a gyro, below, below the atomic level. <laughs> Uh, a gyroscope is like a conglomeration of like, you know, quadrillions, uncountable number of, uh, of atoms uh, as such. So uh, how, how, how is it? Because, you know, that uh, I, I think that the behavior of, I don't know, an, an individual proton, an individual electron, uh, how does that contribute to, you know, the, the procession of like a spinning top, for example, right? Uh, okay. I started out with I started out with simulating a wheel as I showed in this diagram here. Let's see which diagram because that's what I'm kind of wondering about is like how can you simulate uh, a wheel with your bit mechanics, right? Now if we go back to can you just like show your spot diagram? Okay. Uh, here is the simulated space. Diagram. Let's just start with that. Here is the simulated space in three dimensions. Okay, here, here's how we simulated the wheel. So what we exactly uh, are we in the XY view or view to me? We're looking. Well, it's not exactly a wheel, is it? There are rectangular areas, but we're getting as close as we can with the software as it is developed at the present time so that this quadrant contains a mixture of left pointing ar arrows or L bits and down pointing, um, uh, 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 well, it, it's down in this view, but they're actually coming toward us. In this view, they'd be coming toward us, okay, uh, like L, L bits, like and each qu quadrant, so we have a lift counterclockwise spinning attempt to simulate a wheel. Now you could say, well, that, I don't think that really simulates a wheel. But, you know, if if we accept that this is a good shot at simulating this kind of circular wheel concept, uh, we can then go on and observe. Uh, I mean, you're going to have to clarify the, uh, that. I mean, that's really losing me, really. Uh, uh, I, to clarify not, what? I'm not quite sure what we were looking at there. Uh, in my conception, of okay, we we're looking at the the, a, uh, the uh, simulated space of the, of the binary mechanic simulator. That's what we're looking at, the simulated space. The gray areas are where we're going to add L-type bits, which represent momentum in certain directions. Uh, and looking at from the side, the wheel would be spinning this way, uh, you know, around and round. And but if 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 we tilt this for the X Z look as if we're looking from the top, okay, look, looking from the top, and you notice the zero coordinate is down here. Um, these ar arrows would be coming toward us. These arrows would be going to the left and to the right with respect to our uh, point of view, and these arrows are receding from us. You know, if we're just looking the top versus the bottom, well, what are so the we arrows? arrows are not wheels. Wheel. Arrows are not wheels. So you well, kind of arrow. Well, you know, th this is my simulation of a wheel. You, you, you are a circular counterclockwise circular motion of quanta, and certainly when when you spin a gyro wheel, um, I think you would agree that the things in that wheel are moving around in a circle wouldn't wouldn't you sort sort of accept that but this if you would this is extremely close to what happens when you spin a wheel i mean i mean basically going back to your, your spot cube is this basically you know like four spot cubes uh 
exchanging well uh, 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 actually uh, this is hundreds and hundreds of spot cubes this width right here can you see my red cursor here yeah we can, can see you see this red cursor yeah oh okay that is the width of one spot cube that's the width of one spot cube here the width of your cursor that's the really so, small red dot yeah this blinking red dot is between the edge and the gray area here is one spot cube width so there are hundreds of spot cubes in this volume. It's 16 down to zero. And I, I mean, minus, uh, you know, it, it's 32 uh, dimension going this way because the total dimension is 48, zero to 47 is shown. And you, you go here, you, you have a huge number of data here. There's like hundreds of thousands of quanta in this uh, simulation. OK. And this is my attempt to create a wheel. And of course, you uh, a wheel like effect, a counterclockwise motion. And uh, if if your whole basis is you don't think that's a counterclockwise motion or a, a good simulation. Well, I mean, that's a legitimate thing to say. OK, so uh, let me uh, you sort of have to give a reason for that uh, of why that's not uh, acceptable. Well, I'm just what uh, it is. So uh, it sounds to me that you've uh, got simulated, like you've got your axes zero to forty-seven. So there are at least forty-seven spot cubes on the uh, on the axes. Well, this it's kind of forty-seven spots. There be twenty-four spot cubes. Be be because remember a spot. Uh, let's go back. Now basically, okay, this is a spot. The, the dimension cube. of a spot cube is two spots, okay? Two spots. See, go up, down, there's yeah, two. Yeah. Now your spot cube right, left, is actually two. your piece of space, right? So here's your, spots, here's your spot cube. And as I said, a spot cube would fit into here, and there's 24. So we have one, two, and then there's 22 more here, just in the X direction. Yeah. Okay? So let's start from the and beginning. Yeah, so uh, you know, spot cube? I'm I'm beginning to think that you've not downloaded the binary mechanics simulator and ru run it. This is a must. If, if anything I'm saying today is of any interest or even any potential interest, you must down because all of these questions that you're asking is, is what's really going on in the binary mechanics lab simulator. It's free. Download it and run it. You don't even have to know anything to run it. Everything it asks you, just press enter. And, and you get the default run, okay? Well, I suspect that's true, but for the uh, for the benefit of the people who may be watching this later who might not have done that, I think uh, it's uh, a good idea to explain it. I understand. To the point where we can kind of understand what your diagrams are showing. And I believe, you know, one of the, the primary yes, things- Yes, I agree. And, and I, I'm thankful for the points you're raising, Franklin. They're good points. And they're showing maybe weaknesses to someone who's completely unfamiliar with my work, what what I've done here today. But and so I thank thank you for that. And hopefully I've cl clarified that in this relatively huge volume here, there's a whole lot of counterclockwise motion go going on. Uh, by the way, if the axis is here where the red cursor is now in the center, and I made a uh, <clears throat> Uh, a square piece of wood and mounted it on this axis. I could spin that square. It doesn't have to be a wheel. I, I could spin the square and create, you know, put my hand on one corner up here and give it a good spin. Whoa, whoa, that way. And it's going to start to move this way, counterclockwise on the axis that we're seeing looking from the top. <coughs> Why do we choose this view? Because the software uh, tab tabulates the difference in bit density or quanta density in the bottom part of the simulated volume and the top part. So we created our wheel or our counterclockwise motion to take advantage of the fact that in the output files of the sim simulation, there's a variable called top bottom uh, a difference. And that variable you could just plot versus tick and you get the plots that I've shown you right there. There's no data analysis, just, just put the tick versus the top bottom in the particular run.
experimental bias control. This is control one and control two, and we don't see much difference between the, uh, and, and by the way, you could have 30 or 40 runs and put standard error uh, points uh, on each, each of these, uh, you know, to, you, but this is just a pilot study to show you, hey, it works, and it works in, in a fantastic way that one might have never expected. And again, I have to thank Dennis Allen for pointing out, hey, uh, uh, it's, it, it appears that inertial propulsion like Boeing is using, Bo uh, Dennis brings up the Boeing satellite example in his book that I cited, okay, um, mm. uh, is not understood because Newtonian mechanics require separate conservation of angular and linear momentum. And I said, well, well holy smoke, where in binary mechanics are these separately uh, conserved? Well, they're not. The quanta are observed, as, you, as I show, showed you, I never showed you a quanta disappearing or appearing. It just exits from a circular motion and translates out to another location uh, uh, under certain circumstances, which I haven't explained in detail, but that's the laws of motion in binary mechanics. So yes, Franklin, it's good that you raised these quiet questions. Uh, I, I hope I didn't appear impatient or anything else, but yeah, I'm trying to defend what I was do, do, doing so that if we go back here, you know, we can say, Okay, it's not a wheel, folks. I've created like a square, let's say a plywood or something, or iron, uh, you know, with a pivot axis here. And this this thing, I, I can spin the iron. And it's square shape, but I'm still going to have an angular momentum, which is counterclockwise, which in this work I've labeled or designated as left by an assertion of uh, L-type quantum in rectangular volumes, uh, the arrows, you know, and it's not just one quant quant here, it's hundreds of thousands of them, okay? Just so this view here. Uh, I, mean, I can summarize. Slide. I'd like to try and summarize what I understand here, see whether I've got that right. Please. Uh, I'm, I'm, okay, so please. You start out with your, with your uh, spot cube. Bring up your previous slide showing your your basic, because if people have okay, got this, to, oh, okay, this, this view here is a latest of spot cubes. Yeah, well, let's and go the back. Pre, pre the shot shows set. a single spot cube, which contains eight spots. Okay, let's and look the at eight that. spot is uh -huh. yes. Okay, so sorry. Go my ahead. understanding is that this is uh, like uh, the basic. But building block of space, basically, is, is space just exactly a latest of spot cubes. Yeah. And when you're talking about a motion of something, say an electron, uh, you showed that uh, the in that the spaghetti diagrams, the motion of an electron. And when an electron moves, it's actually going from one of these cubes to the other cube. Right. That is what. That is how you are. Um, ah, very you. good, Franklin. You are a good uh, moderator here to help cl clarify this. Oh, okay. Here is one spot cube in the latest of spot cubes. And let's take this black arrow. When we exit the circular motion, it goes to a red uh, 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 matter dequark. So electrons are matter. So we have matter to matter is, con is conserved. If by unconditional bit operation, the the uh, this quant quanta which is here goes out in this direction where I'm I'm pointing with my little uh, red dot cursor here, what is here? The next spot cube. So that if we imagine it's not shown, but it, it would be entering the electron here, which would be right out here in the next spot cube, not shown. Uh, so that if we move from here to he whoops, uh, oh my gosh, I, kick, I I clicked the wrong mouse button. Uh, if if we move in this direction, and the where it's going to be show you is an electron qu uh, quanta uh, winding up in another electron spot, or if it doesn't get that far, it certainly has moved from an electron spot into a quark 
spot, a matter quark, spot. And by the way, one of the biggest issues in particle physics is the uh, interchange or conversion between lepton and quark particles. This is the uh, uh, the uh, holy grail, show, showing you that here we have from an electron spot a quantum moving into a quark spot. If we imagine over here in this side, another red one, but over here in this area, moving into the electron, we're going to have a quark to electron conversion. Now, all of those conversions, I have a whole separate video on that. It's called particle motion mechanisms or something like that. Uh, but at any rate, the point here for today, here is our spin, spin axis, is that angular momentum within the electron spot can translate into transla uh, translational motion. Uh, under the conditions where we don't do have a strong operation, which would go normally from this bit locus to this bit locus, and then go down to here, and then strong operation to this bit locus. And I barely can hear you. Could you speak up, sir? I don't no, know. I'm getting an echo. We are getting a few little interference here. But, but in any case, from a uh, from a beginner's uh, point of view, the the electron moves from uh, one of these cubes to the next cube, and that's what you're saying is uh, linear momentum, right? Yeah. The black arrows. Because I think that's something that's very important. You have to you know realize that uh, this this picture here is a is like a quantum of space. And that the electrons or the protons are just a pattern of movement within that block, right? You showed the very complicated proton. And the only well, difference the proton and the electron is that its path is much more complicated, right? Exactly. And when we say the quanta, these the purple circle and the black lines here are the translational motion or linear momentum motion, uh, <clears throat> are quanta one state bit quanta motion. This is the electron spot. Collectively, what's going on in this spot gives you the properties of the electron, okay? And there could be no quanta in, in this spot here, or there could be one, two, three, and I, and I have several pay papers a analyzing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important mm -hmm. to distinguish an individual quanta from the actual particle, uh, which we might call the electron or the, uh, the, a, a particular matter quark, red, blue, or green. And the antimatter ones are the light red, uh, light red, light blue, and light green in this particular di diagram. And they're next to the positron spot, which is on the other side of the cube, which we don't see. Now, getting back to the next slide. Okay, okay let's go to the next slide. This, this shows oh, the minus one. Motivate, which is uh, how you're simulating. And go to the next slide, uh, back to the, the, the wheel slide, I guess. Okay. So it would seem to me that understanding that that's what your space is and that's how electrons move, that what you've done is that you just uh, preferentially or cause quantum. electrons to move you just, you set up a very large matrix of uh, of these these uh, of these space locations, and you have uh, simulated like all the electrons moving in one direction, and then you know say down in your chart, and then a bunch of electrons moving to the right. So you just, you you just, you started that up. I mean, technically, I I think intuitively, uh, the space isn't moving but the, the electrons within that space are moving. Would that be correct? Well, well said, Franklin. I would substitute the word quanta to distinguish <coughs> the individual quanta, one state bits, from the electron as a particle. So yeah, if everything you just something you marching you around in your bit. Quanta for electron, and it's correct. And I thank you for helping uh, to... Uh, to um, explain this. 
No, notice that when, when we say zero to 47 here, or zero to 47 in the in the left right view here, um, that's 47 spots or 24 spot cubes wide. All right. And that is our volume, which is randomly seeds, seeded for the control conditions. And then we added L bits, which indicate or uh, are a representation of future motion. Okay, a future motion, tomorrow's motion. We add the L bits as shown here to create. I was trying to create a wheel like Lathwork and the gyroscope people at Boeing had. And the whole gist of this is when we get up to here with the nun, all that work I had to create the wheel was irrelevant. In other words, those arrows I could distribute anywhere in the gray space. Anywhere here randomly. Just this mixture of arrows, it, I, I wouldn't have to se separate them out as they're neatly separated out here to look like a judge gyro wheel, oh, okay? I could just put them anywhere and I get the same result, which is an amazing thing. And that's what the none slide means. No wheel, no wheel, madness control. Just put them anywhere, just the same amount of them, but put them anywhere in the gray area specified in the simulated space and look at tick 37, you know, like in Excel, you, you can actually highlight the dot and find out exactly how long it takes before this sideways motion kicks into the procession. And this is apparently a fundamental property of the procession that it takes a little time to get going, okay? And part of this time is probably the bits uh, which at at, at tick zero are randomly distributed, which is probably an unphysical um, representation or situation. They will organize themselves into what is a, a more physically accurate uh, representation, but there's still some additional time apparently required before the precession of the gyroscope kicks in. And as that organization of the L bits uh, <clears throat> dissipates, which is the angular momentum dissipating, the procession dissipates. This is exactly what oh, the one hour lace, uh, lace uh, weight lecture at the Royal Society Christmas lecture uh, in La London showed uh, on the YouTube vi video of, of, of this very ingenious man. So people, they want to know what <laughs> software is. Can we go and uh, find that? So I just Googled Fine. binary mechanics and uh, well, I got to your, is this, is this a binary mechanics blogspot.com? Is that? Yep. That, that, that is the journal of binary mechanics. You can also get to it with www.binary-mechanics.com, which is just a placeholder, which sends you to that same journal. Journal of Binary Mechanics site. That is the Journal of Binary Mechanics, the, the whole deal. I haven't written up this paper. Today's presentation is the first presentation anywhere of any kind of this information. What I'm going to do is create a video of what I have just pre presented and a paper um, at that website that you just mentioned, uh, Frank. But here, here we have it. The procession. It's, it's it's just amazing, and you don't have to make the wheel. All of that in the previous slides that I went through and said, well, you know, we're going to put the arrows here and there, and it's clockwise, and uh, our left. It didn't seem to make any difference. Now, Lathworth or nobody else that I know has covered that part of it, but I have. You can spin the wheel right or left, clockwise counterclockwise depending upon your point of view of how you're looking at the wheel down the axis uh, it doesn't seem to matter in terms of the procession that you get this is an amazing effect called inertial propulsion and uh, the then I said well what if we don't create the wheel at all what if we put the same bits 
the same L type bits and just put them in the whole area gray randomly. They could be anywhere. And that's what the none, the no wheel condition here is. Same result. Which shows you that the whole, in my opinion, this says to me, and by the way, I was surprised to see these results because I had just spent a bunch of hours setting up the wheel. <laughs> and then I find you don't even need the wheel. You just need to add the, the correct um, mixture of um, L bits in a sub volume of the simulated volume, the gray area shown in the diagram that we've been talking about uh, in order to get the precession, okay? And you and this can be quantitatively analyzed. This is an amount of displacement. We have the mass of a quanta. We have the time. We can start to calculate the acceleration here that is going on, and 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 get in a real you know, in, in terms of mass, length, and time units, a uh, value for this. Okay. Now, the Boeing engineers and, and Lathworth and so on were, were just going by intuition, I guess. But now we can actually calculate these things with the work I've just presented, I, I do believe. It may be premature to say that, but it, the data I presented to you suggests that that is correct. And the fact that you don't even need to organize these in ter terms of a wheel like I showed in the schematic diagram of the simulated volume is eye-opening. Oh my God, this suggests that it's really at the very much uh, bit cycle with the arrows and all of that stuff, you know, the black arrows coming out of the electron, the yellow electron spot and so forth, and the other arrows, the blue and the gray ar arrows, go back to that diagram and pause. And it just, that that the, at this microscopic level seems to explain the whole phenomena of inertial propulsion. I mean, it's stunning as far as I'm concerned. And thank you for Dennis Allen for, I never would have even gotten into this, but this is the nice thing about binary mechanics. Almost any subject that you take up, usually within a matter of hours or perhaps just a few days, you've solved it, whether it's matter, Antimatter asymmetry, whether it's uh, Pauli exclusion principles. Go, I mean, I, there's dozens of issues that you can just list, and it just they they just solve themselves with full quantization in binary mechanics. End of sub speech. I so, hope there are uh, other questions. Dennis, what do you think? You've inspired James. So, what do you think, Dennis? Go ahead and unmute yourself first and get done with your coughing. And uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. You got to unmute yourself first. Yeah, if, if, if anybody asks questions, it'll help point out to be the defects in my uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, I, just I, like I, your questions, Frank Franklin went a hundred miles in clarifying what I was trying to communicate. So anyone with any question, there is no dumb question here. Anything I've said you don't understand or, or, or catch, bring it up and you're gonna help me to be able to explain it better in the Franklin? future. Franklin? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. We hear you. Uh, we hear you. Yeah, the direction of the space that you found uh, is uh, apparently, as far as I can tell, uh, just a Newton's absolute space. Uh, the Earth is moving through absolute space at a certain velocity at each moment of time, and that velocity uh, changes slightly because it rotates around the sun and rotates around its axis and so on. But at any fixed time, the Earth is moving through absolute space at a certain uh, definite velocity. And the direction of that velocity is the direction that uh, I think uh, you found, James. Okay, Dad. Uh, okay. uh, this is just my first take. There's so much work to be done on this. Uh, like, I've started to think I'm not an astronomer. Um, I probably have a high school level understanding of astronomy. But the first thing I thought is, gee whiz, 
we have all of these objects like the Earth spinning. And, well, the Earth is a big gyroscope then. And the precession could be calculated or, or, or added into the equation in terms of uh, determining the orbit of the Earth. The other thing I ask in terms of an absolute, I looked up the word anisotropy, and I pointed out that the precession vector, the the sum of all of those three minus ones I showed you, both the proton and the electron bit cycles, point in one absolute direction. So I started to ask, well, gee whiz, are galaxies on a certain plane? You know, we hear talking about this galaxy and that galaxy. Are, are they all on the same plane? No one ever says that. You you get it? You know, like the spin of the ga galaxies, are, are they on the same plane? Uh, uh, you know, are approximately the same plane? I mean, there's all sorts of questions which co come up here. Well, I'm pretty sure galaxies can spin at any which direction and, and, and angle. Although what was interesting well, from what uh, you but, said... Yeah, I, well, now I'm not sure. Well, I think... Well, they're the observed on the, uh, the, the planes of the rotations are observed to be at uh, different, uh, their perpendiculars are not parallel. Okay, well, you okay. see, like, the three arrows of inertial, uh, of, of, of translation in my inertial propulsion analysis, uh, uh, each pair of those arrows is perpendicular to the other, okay, uh, yeah. of, of the three arrows. Uh, of, of translation. So it allows for a wide variety of, of effects. But I'm wondering, for example, where Le uh, Lathwaite in this Royal Society one hour presentation to the children, it was called the Christmas presentation of the Royal Society, uh, put a gyroscope that's gimbaled in, in X, Y, and Z directions uh, so it can as assume any angle that it wants put it to spin and attach it to a string and showed the procession as going around in a circle and he was in indicating that uh, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, di diameter of the circle and the shape of it depended upon various factors and um, so <clears throat> I'm wondering wh whether even analysis of such a simple experiment of that the precise day de data there might indicate what this absolute direction uh, th is that I have, uh, like, I'm waiting for the experimentalist to come up and do the experiment to detect the absolute direction that I have presented well, in, here today. In, in, in chapter one of uh, uh, J.P. Wesley's Scientific Physics, his last solo book, uh, he explains uh, all the different experiments which uh, show just what direction in space the uh, uh, solar system is moving and uh, uh, based on Romer's <coughs> results, uh, Bradley's results, both astronomers of course, and Romer's results were known to Newton which is uh, apparently why he created absolute space. And uh, then there was uh, others such as uh, 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 Stefan Marinoff's, Stephen Marinoff's uh, couple of mirror experiment uh, with light and also his chopped light experiment, which gave uh, even more accurate uh, determination relative to the fixed stars of which direction the solar system is moving. And, and of course that speed is so fast that the rotation of the Earth around the Sun uh, wouldn't change the magnitude, just the apparent direction because uh, well because it's rotating. So uh, if you and you can get that book, I'll if you like, I'll send you the address to get that book. It's uh, fifty dollars, fifty-five dollars plus four dollars shipping and handling. I think was what it was. And uh, his widow uh, Wesley is dead, but his widow uh, Mrs. Wesley. Uh, Still sells these books to, to supplement her income. Okay. Well, thanks about that. Now, your reference, De Dennis, to absolute space uh, fits with the spot cube latest uh, of the binary mechanics.
mechanic model of space indicated here. And this fixed direction um, reference uh, uh, in this absolute space, to use your term, I like that term, um, we have to look Absolutely. at all the anisotropies and, well, Newton's term, okay, thank you. Um, uh, how we might determine what this fixed direction reference is. Well, as I say, it's or been determined it in, fact uh, in, in a number of different ways. So if you can get it from your binary mechanics and you can just check if it's in the, it has the same magnitude, well, in magnitude when maybe you couldn't get that. But whether it has the right direction or not, uh, if you do an experiment at a certain time, you can compare it with uh, uh, Wesley's results, which are summarized in a one page at the end of chapter one in terms of the fixed stars, what direction it is with respect to the fixed stars. Exactly. Well, uh, I can't do that, of course, with the simulator, because that's just a simulation on a computer. It'd have to be yeah. some observational or experimental data with, with a gyroscope or uh, God knows what anisotropy. I looked up anisotropy uh, tropy uh, re recently, I had done so years ago, and there were only a few items mentioned. Now the Wikipedia article on anisotropy, uh, you know, lists dozens of, uh, of effects which are anisotropic, which fits with the um, lack of um, precise, which worried me a lot at the beginning, the precise, um, um, like, if we look at the spot cube, for example, there are some asymmetries in the spatial model. Let's see if I can go, go back here. No, I can't. Uh, okay, slideshow. Let's go to slideshow again. View show. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. We're, we're at the beginning here. Uh, okay, so if I go there. There. You, you, you see here, we have some symmetry in that the arrows representing motion, which are the L bits, these are the M bits, the circles. <coughs> are symmetrical. They go both ways in equal amounts. However, the electrons on one side and the positrons on the other side, and that determines that axis between the two, that solid diagonal of the spot cube, determines this absolute direction. And that's an asymmetry. And that worried me a lot, but apparently that asymmetry is our savior. Uh, <laughs> you know, because without that, we probably wouldn't have uh, the explanation for of the mechanism of inertial pr propulsion uh, on hand. One of the great challenges is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not. I heard somebody there, but they sort of figured out about knowing that you think you're right, but what I, I, it's it's a quote that I've heard before. Should should I go out of the uh, screen sharing mode here or what? Because I can't see anybody. I, oh, I well, just see my um, own. Well, what I was interested in is uh, your software download. Now, for some reason, uh, my browser kept on crashing every single time I tried to share the screen. But uh, maybe you can share, uh, instead of your presentation, is your website and where you download your software so we can see how that, how you can get that. I've tried going to that website, and it looks a little bit confusing as to uh, what you're supposed to download. It goes to a page called the Hot Basic Downloads. And uh, I tried... Yeah, right, and it, it's the hotspot.zip da download. Let's see, end the show. Now let me see if I go to... Uh, yeah, just bring up a browser window. Here, um, I, I have, I have uh, an article here, but th this is uh, the article on elementary uh, particle up-down spin. Uh, that doesn't have the, the reference in it. Uh, well, let's I see. noticed that. Let me that see if I can get the software uh, download is in the right hand, right hand side. Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to break. I'm going to break. Yeah, it's a hotspot. Dot zip is what what you want to uh, uh, get, and 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 just and just create a physics uh, subdirectory and unzip it, and you're all ready to run it. The program is hotspot. 
dot exe. Let's see here. I, uh, let's see if I can get an article here uh, that has the uh, the link. Uh, okay. I, I, let's see. Law of motion. No, it is on your website. The binary uh, mechanics uh, lab simulator. Let's see if, if if this article gives a link, and I'll follow the link. There it goes, loading. Because the link leads to. Uh, you can still see my screen, right? Let's see here. Uh, it looks blank right now. Well, let's see. Uh, we're gonna go. Looks like it's bringing up a PDF. I'm not file. seeing the article. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's bringing up a PDF file, and I'm I'm just trying to get the link. Well, the link is on your main page. The link is on your main page. Right. So I. Oh yeah. Out. Well, you just go there. Oh oh oh. Okay. This is interesting. Here, let's see if I can get this positioned. Oh, come on. It won't roll. I think you're the download. Uh, I had a picture uh, of the. Is uh, right there in the links there. Binary mechanics. Well, one of them says forum, but I think one of them says software. Yeah. So I think. Right. Now, now here is a here, here, of an older version. This is an older article. But see, here I'm showing you. If I can get this to move, it takes forever for some reason, perhaps because of, I don't know why. Come on. Come on. Go. There. There, I've almost got the whole screen. Oh, okay. This red area here is the simulated space. Here we have the dimension is 32. It was 48 in the work that I just showed you. Here's a histogram of the spectrum of, of bits leaving you know, so you you could analyze the spectrum uh, uh, and 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 get the hydrogen spectrum and things like that. Here's a X Y Z histogram of the density of bits in in this area, and various data over here. So here you see here is our simulated volume, and uh, various things are shown. So this is so yeah. So like if you just get hotspot zip and uh, run it, I have some videos on my. Uh, uh, bit shoot uh, site, which is binary mechanics lab with the spaces there being underscore characters and capital letters, capital B for binary and uh, M for mechanics and L for lab at, on bit shoot, which, which give tutorials on running the simulator. But ba basically, if you just uh, download the zip file, hotspot.zip, unzip it into a directory. Um, and well, I'm not make, seeing make your own that. Directory. Oh. I mean, we still need to find out where that link is. I clicked on one link. I got something called hbsetup.zip, HB setup, and uh, that does not appear to no, be. No, that, that, that's when hot I basic. It, when that's I hot it, basic. Uh, I I'm the author of hot basic. This dang thing won't. Uh, so that's let, not let's it. Let's go right? here. That's not your hotspot simulator. So we still need to find out yeah, where. Yeah, let, let's see. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Binary mechanics lab bi videos. Free binary mechanics software. I'm going to click click on this right now. Yeah, that's what I clicked on, and I got basically the, the hot basic compiler. Let's see what you okay, get. Okay, and then we get to. Yeah, this page. Okay, I'm getting this page. And somewhere here, there's going to be hotspot. Here it is. Latest version. The Binary Mechanics Lab Particle Physics Software Simulates Time Development. You click here and you get a zip file. Okay, <laughs> now, thing. let's see. I'm going to run. Just to, I, I, I'm going to run the simulator right now on our full screen so that you yeah, can see that. what we're talking about. Okay, I, I so we can, really can this. make that a problem. We can get rid of this. Get rid of the browser or, or minimize it. And now I'm going to run the sim simulator right now. Let's see. Hotspot. It's loading. You see the, the little hourglass here? 
That's my daughter when she was a, a 10 years old. I never thought she, her picture was going to come up with. Uh, do you want to allow this app? Yes. Come on, run it. There we go. Now, it, there's all kinds of instructions that you can read about this through the article. I'm just going to press enter. Can you see the simulator there? Let me center it on the screen. Right there. Okay, I'm going to press enter. Wow, I, this is amazing that we can do this in these Saturday chats. I pressed enter, and it's going to allow me to, to in, input a certain file. We're just going to cancel that, and I'm going to put zero. Uh, I, I, I can put a randomization seed there. I'm going to press enter for the default, which is 48. Uh, here we're going to have options. I press enter, and it has created... 165,000 Kuana, okay? Add more objects. I press yes. Uh, it, I can add more objects, but right now I'm going to press no because we're just going to go the... I'm just pressing enter for every prompt, and now it's running. Uh, okay. Okay, we've started. The bit density, the default is 0.25, shown over here. And it's running very slow because of, I, I guess, all the CPU time that's being used for the stream yard. But here's an X-ray view. The lighter uh, pixels, each pixel here is a spot, and the light, you know, which contains up to six qu quanta in it, from zero to six quanta each spot. And it's showing the an X-ray view of the spot density of the randomly seeded uh, volume of 48, which is exactly what I used. The dimension here, it says up here, can you see my red cursor here? Uh, 48. There's 110,000 spots in this, okay? And uh, we're showing the bit density, which is the X-ray view. And here it's running through tick one. What, what's going, going to happen? Here the net charge is minus 48. Uh, here are various statistics. These are the particles that we have. Um, the kinetic energy and so forth. We'll we'll see that when this gets updated. There. Oh, okay. Here is the uh, uh, the number of events in the vector or electrostatic bit op. Uh, excuse me. The magnetic bit operation and the scalar bit operation is the S. F is the strong bit bit operation. Here are your electron and the three colors of the quartz: red, green, and blue. And then we got 74 particles by a certain criteria. And here's the antimatter. And by the way, the E plus R is your right-handed lepton, which is the positron. And we have a bunch of those. <coughs> Here is the percent of, of the quanta. And there's about one-eighth, you, you can see here, uh, in this very initial stage, going on. And as we run around, this is the position of uh, the, uh, the average position of the uh, quanta in the proton bit cycle and the electron bit cycle. And the P line here is the change from the last tick. So this is our motion, our translation uh, of the center of protein quanta, if you wanna look at it that way, the same way the E line is for, for X, Y, and Z, one, two, three dimensions, the uh, translation of the, elect of the quanta in the electron. And the change is this and this the change of position for the electron quanta and the proton quanta shown in DP green. And at, at tick 50, which I don't know whether we're going to last because it's going so slow, but we're going to start to calculate the proton electron mass ratio. But you see to start to run this, so now you can start to see. Now that diagram I showed you, I was creating a huge wheel in this area. By the way, I can make it look more square if I go to properties, and let's see, the options, uh, I think options, uh, font, yeah, if I uh, go eight by eight, there, now it actually looks square. It's a little harder to read now, but if you want to make it look square, but you see in this area here is where I created my wheel. The way I did that was by first creating uh, a randomized situation such as we started with here in this demonstration, and then adding L, uh, 
L, L bits to create the circular motion that I thought would be appropriate for a, a larger object uh, showing angular momentum. And then my presentation showed that it didn't even matter if I carefully arranged these in a circle. I could just put those same L bits anywhere in, in, in the uh, dark gray area in my diagram, and I get the same results, which shows that it's a, a very microscopic thing at the level of binary mechanics that's going on in the whole story of inertial propulsion, which was amazing to me. I thought I would destroy the effect. Uh, uh, in other words, the no wheel condition in my presentation was sort of a control condition. I was expecting to get nothing there. Oh, I got about the same effect uh, as I got with, by carefully constructing what I thought was a spinning wheel or to make Franklin happy a spinning square, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or plane, uh, you know, or a piece of plywood or something that is mounted in a square shape, it's not circular shape. Okay, so, so anyway, Bill's got a question for you. Bill, you had a question you wanted to ask? It's easier to read if I go back to the uh, uh, regular default character size. And what was the font? So I'll go back to the eight by twelve, which apparently there. Okay, it's it looks now rectangular, but really uh, it's uh, running your binary mechanic simulator, and the screen looks all messed up. Uh, do you know why that would be? It's just uh, it looks like a terminal screen scrolling all over the place. Oh, you have to set it up. Uh, there's a video on, on my BitShoot for the first run of the simulator. You're, you're running it on your computer now? Yeah, I got I loaded it up. And well, Frank, uh, you are the man. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, uh, if that happens, you have to follow. You can do this. I'll show you right now. Right click on the icon. Uh, up, well, you can exit the program, let's say. And st well, yeah, st st start it again. By uh, okay, I'm uh, maybe start it you again. don't have to exit. Maybe you don't have to exit. Well, I, I, if, I'm gonna start hotspot that XC and it says output file entered. Yeah, okay, don't do anything, don't do anything except right. I have a video on this now. Right click, you see, I'm up here on my screen. Uh, right click exactly. on the icon in the upper left hand quarter, corner and choose properties. Property. Okay. Yeah, properties. Yeah, got that properties. And then, and then be sure that your buffer size and number of buffers are fifty-four. Buffer size under command history or uh, 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 under options. Click the options tab. Yeah. And and you're gonna see fifty-four, or at least I did. Now later versions of Windows have this problem, and here's how you fix it. Okay, click on font. Huh? It should say eight times twelve, and raster fonts. The special characters that you see on my screen are weird characters, which are the old-fashioned way back in the pre the previous century. The raster fonts, and so you you want to click raster fonts and eight by twelve. Now go to layout. Just a second. Uh, I don't see that. So the, the, you the font, don't see font, the font I tab. Font, but let's see the the options I have here. Uh, well, you know, with courier that's the options and... tab. That's the options tab. Oh, okay. The options tab should say 54, and that's all you do there. Uh, so then I'm click on the font tab. And the font tab. Click on the font tab, and you're going to see the raster fonts and 8 by 12 character size, 8 by 12 pixel character size. See, that I don't see in the, in the selection for fonts. The production that I've got size, and the only thing I've got there is like numbers from five to seventy-two. That's all I've got. What font do you have selected? Raster fonts. Okay, and they're in alphabetical order. Font. Okay, I find that. Raster you have to font. select raster fonts, or you're going to have garbage. Yeah. Okay, I got that. Raster font, and what's the size of the font you want? Uh, well, here it's in pixels. Is eight by twelve, maybe in whatever version of. Eight by uh, twelve. Okay, I got that. All right. So we got. Okay, that. now click the layout. The layout uh, tab. Yeah, layout. 
Oh, okay. And uh, okay. if you can simultaneously look at what I have on my screen, the screen buffer size width is 9999. The width is 999. Well, that's what I have, and it's where I'm working. So that seems strange that it has to be so much. Okay, don't wrap it, and then the 9999 width. Right? I'm showing it on my screen now, if you can see it. Yeah, it's too small for me to see, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. The height is, uh, well, in your brow browser, you maybe you can magnify it. The height should be 65. Height should be 65. Yeah, as a host, I can't. So uh, it's, it's just small. The window size width. Do you see that? Yeah, width. Yeah, width. 102. Now, the program actually sets that by using an API. So it should say 102, but if it doesn't, that is your character width for the display. And it should be 102 or else you're going to have a mess. Okay, and the height? 55 rows. 55, okay. We've now, the window that. position, you can set anything you want. Uh, I have mine initially set to zero, zero. But if you okay, move the window, so it's going to show a different value. Zero, zero puts the window in the upper left-hand corner of whatever screen you happen to be using. Now click mm -hmm. OK. Now click OK. Now, okay. Now I can... All right. Now, yes, press enter, and it's going to ask you for an input file, but cancel that. And that at every prompt you see after that, this is the quick start for the beginner without reading about the instructions or anything else. Just press enter for every option after that. Every option, enter, okay. Now, remember, this is a laboratory... This is a laboratory simulation program. It was made to get the job done, not to necessarily to be user friendly. So okay, uh, I'm trying to, to make it more I'd user like friendly with that. time, but uh, I've developed features in the program required to do certain experiments, which was uh, obviously the whole reason to have such a program in the first place to be able to do certain uh, uh, experiments. Okay, it's working for me now. So now anyone can go and download your hotspot, and uh, you have to do those little fix-ups. Um, but then, oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. Working now. now, 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 press the P key. I'm pressing the P key on mine. That's going to show. Yeah. Now now it has, uh, it has to complete the cycle. So I press the key, and you see it going down row by row here, and then finally. Now it's going to show the proton. And the depth scale you see on the upper right, on my view, the upper right here is the depth scale. So the, uh, the nearness are, are, you see, because we're looking into the front. You can imagine this whole thing is a box, okay? And we're looking at the front X, Y. Here's Y and a right, a left right is x and we're looking at a box now pretty soon we're going to see a histogram uh, uh up here on the right when we have enough day, data it's running extremely slow because i i, I guess Streamyard uses a lot of cpu time which is fine i, I mean i don't oh there's our histogram now this is showing the distribution actually of all of the quanta but the next uh, tw 21 ticks, which is the length of time um, of the proton bit cycle, it's going to show you uh, the histogram of where the proton, according to the criteria you use to show these P's for, for pro proton, uh, are located in, in, in the histogram, okay? So we can see that there are different views which are possible here. Uh, the X-ray view of all the quanta, which I just showed you, and this one is the P. And you notice down here it says P equals 1. If I press P again, it will toggle back to 0. But uh, I don't know how long we'll go here. But if we get up to tick 42 here, tick 42 would be the second uh, histogram appearing. See, we've had the first. It says 1 here, which will be just the pro proton distribution. And this is X, Y, Z in three dimensions. So there's actually three histograms summed up here. In each well, of the exactly three dimensions. What are we looking at here? We're looking at random space uh, tracking the protons. 
Well, yeah, here we have the Proton Display. Now, if you want a real user-friendly, by, by the way, that setup that you did by right-clicking the upper left-hand icon in the Hotspot Execute uh, Display, you won't have to do again, okay? The next time you run Hotspot, your, your uh, Windows operating system will remember what those settings were for that application. So, so that you don't have to do that ever again. Now, I'm going to run the more user-friendly BMLS program, Binary Mechanic Lab Simulator program, which is an interface to create all kinds of spaces. And uh, the hourglass here is showing that uh, it's starting to run. By the way, in civilization, I'm doing quite well. <laughs> now let's see here. See here, I can choose the dimension uh, of 48 is the default. What trial uh, had what I'm going to show? X-ray view, wh whether I'm going to be in random mode or box mode. These things I'm not explaining right here. Whether the right gun or the left gun is on. These things are used to measure the speed of light. The different experiments which are explained in the help. Let Let's put the help up. Let, let's go back to here, and if I click, if I press the character H, when this cycle that is now refreshing the view finishes, oh, you're going slow. <laughs> look, look, look at that. You usually it goes so fast you don't even see this. I mean, it just goes zip, 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 zip. Oh, 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 okay. I pressed H, and we're going to go to the help screen. Okay, so there's all, all kinds, you know, the XY plane. Um, you, you you can do all kind, kinds of sexy stuff here. Save the simulation volume as files which can be loaded or an, analyzed. Um, uh, very, very, these are the experiments. You could do laser uh, experiment, increase bit density with each tick. Uh, three and four are the experiments I use to demonstrate the speed of light in my recent paper titled Light Speed Derivation. Um, here we have uh, find the uh, find bit density for observed proton electron mass ratio, uh, other experiments which are pre pre packaged in in there, the X-ray view on and off, uh, the y, just the Y density histogram instead of the X Y Z density that we're showing and so forth. Now if I press space bar, we go back to the regular view and it's on tick 25. Showing the pro proton. Now you have to ask, some protons at about the same depth, they're all yellow here. See, these are different col colors. They look like they're next to each other, but they're really not. They're far away. But but these are all the same depth, uh, depth scale one here. Yeah, yeah, so that might be a three proton object here <coughs> or, or, or more. Be, because we only see the one that's nearest there there could be one behind it that is is shown we're because again we're looking in the front of the box as it, the sim simulated volume and so we're only going to see what's uh, up front in this, this view there could be something behind there so I need to write software to analyze these volumes um, and that's why you can if you press the s key you'll save the uh, the the volumes and um, I, I, I can specify you the format that they're formatted in, so a anyone that writes software can write pro programs to find out, for example, you know, how, are, are there helium atoms in there or whatever. Uh, or, you know, if, if you have a series of them, uh, is, is a proton moving? Proton, of course, is the hydrogen nucleus, uh, uh, a hydrogen nucleus. So here, here we're showing the, the pro protons, and you notice by going to help, we lost the histogram display, <laughs> but when we get up to the next uh, cycle, which gives you an, enough data to do the histogram again, uh, which would be at tick 42. <laughs> uh, but let, let, let's go back to uh, the BMLS lab simulator interface. Here you can set the initial state, and I'm just using the defaults here. I haven't really changed anything. 
And here the file name is, is 48, that's the dimension. It's uh, the RAN mode is, is, is on the R. Here's the bit density, 2500, shown here. And the bit operations order, SUVF. And the trial number is trial one. In case we want to do 30 trials, we could go one, two, three, four, five, and just run the thing over and over again. So here we're setting up to randomly um, seed the whole volume. Now if I set, save parameters, now I have a file here, which is in the bat subdirectory. It's a text file. And if I run the simulator, which I can't do now because I'm already running the simulator Windows well, I've never even tried it. Can you have two copies of the simulator running? I suppose you could. But in <coughs> you can see here that this is a more user-friendly interface. And the neat thing is that if I, for example, set initial state, instead of doing saving the parameters, I can change things here where the range in x y and z what types of bits or here are the types of spots and here are the types of bits plus and minus n bits minus and plus the arrows in the different directions that those l bits here's up down here is coming toward us going away from us in the z, z dimension and so forth i that's how i constructed this so i could select a range in which a certain uh, type of bit is put in and then say set initial state again it's going to add more lines here and in fact to create the wheel there was actually four of uh, five of these one was the initial state here and then one for the arrow to the left one for the arrow to the right because they were all in different spatial volumes sub volumes of total cellular space but that's how this user friendly uh, thing you know, so you don't have to deal with all these n numbers and everything. These two five five and two five five are bit mass for the type of spot and the type of bit, and you don't have to know what all those bit net mass uh, mask values are. You can just click them here on, on and off, choose a sub volume, and literally construct anything you want in this volume to do any experiment that you want. So that, uh, I'll just exit this program now because I, I've given you the basic idea of how it works. Uh, and when you're done setting the initial state, you save parameters, then you have a file just like we had up here. And then you can run that and you can have multiple files here. You you could create a whole bunch of con con conditions and let it run all night or all week or whatever. And when it's done, you run many, many files rather than manually starting it the hard way by running hotspot execute direct okay so that's the interface uh more user-friendly in interface to the bml uh simulator, which is called hotspot.execute okay as well that's a good introduction yeah. for people to how to find your software uh, I would recommend you make the, the hotspot link a little bit more prominent, maybe, I don't know, put that on the front page or something like that. And uh, right, okay. I want to open it up more, more for questions. So I know I think Bill put a question in the chat. So why don't we go ahead and take Bill's question here. Tell um, me when I should take this off and come back. Uh, I mean, take off my uh, screen sharing. Oh, you can go ahead and take that off now. Oh, okay. Thank you, Frank Franklin. You are the boss man here. <laughs> okay, I have screen sharing off. I'm if I press escape, how how do you stop it? If you put zero trials or you know zero ticks to run when you start it, it'll run forever. But and but escape at any time, it's going to when it completes here, it's going down. Oh, I stopped the screen. It, it it's going to exit that and save the files and exit the pro program. So now let's see if I go back to uh, StreamYard, here I, <laughs> my God, you see all of that time, you didn't have to look at my ugly face. <laughs> no, we were doing, we, we were showing you Hi, your software. So go ahead, Bill. 
Okay, uh, my question is, um, can we do any uh, tests that could be checked experimentally? Uh, for instance, uh, the, the uh, gyroscope that uh, Eric Laithwaite used was a, a round, circular. Suppose I made one that was square or I made one that was just uh, a bar that was rotating perpendicular to the main axis of the bar. Um, and, I, and I made all of these the same weight, so I should have the same number of uh, uh, items in binary mechanics. Um, so what would 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 binary mechanics say that would be the same because you have the same number of uh, 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 those uh, cubes that you have, or would it be different because the overall geometry uh, is different? Well, since uh, I I I had the no wheel as a control bill, um, mm -hmm. because I I wanted to see if the wheel. Uh, or the spinning uh, square, uh, to take Fra Franklin's uh, comments into uh, welcome comments in, into consideration. Uh, s s I, I created the spinning uh, square um, because I thought that whole thing was, was, was necessary. And then I went to the no wheel distribution of the same number of, um, of L type bits. Uh, the arrow bits we, we could call them the ar the ar arrow bits if you want uh, the arrow quanta um, <clears throat> and um, I found to my surprise that was supposed to be a control to show that the whole thing didn't work be be because the the L bits were not arranged in a uh, circular motion like the uh, the uh, uh, sp spreading uh, squares were in 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 the pre previous you know the right left uh, condition, but I found basically the same result, e even if these quanta are mixed up. So I think this lends to this is hot off the press. It lends to a, a analysis with the binary mechanics simulator as it is now. One could cr cr create all kinds of different shapes and uh, put in the same number of L type bits to to create sp spinning and uh, use the top-down difference variable, which is in, uh, in the output CSV files, which you just click, click on those files and it loads right into an Excel spreadsheet type program, depending upon what you have installed on your computer. And then you could actually just plot the tip times the tick, the BMLS tick, which is your time variable, uh, uh, by the top-down difference variable, which at the present version is the very last a variable or column in in the uh, CSV output files to the right. To scroll over, you you could just plot those two variables as I've shown you today. So that this is hot off the press, and Bill's question is very pertinent. Anyone here can uh, do these experiments. Go ahead and do the experiments. Get the results. Plot the results. Uh, uh, submit them to the Journal of Binary Mechanics or present them here or, you know, make your own video of them or paper or whatever you want to do, but please let me know what your results are. This is all brand new, hot off the press. What I'm alleging is that my work shown today, which, which took just a few days to do actually, rendered a, a complete uh, explanation of the mechanism of inertial propulsion. Uh, I mean, so today is party day. You know, we should all go out and celebrate and have, you know, play music and dance and have drinks together and chit chat. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of day that doesn't happen. How long has Boeing been putting up these satellites without knowing how they work? Well, you know, I mean, it could be many years. So that today is a rather special day, even for the Boeing engine should look at this. So yeah, the software is there, and uh, if you want to do an experiment, which I haven't programmed yet, let me know. I, either I can help you to program it, or um, uh, uh, change, you know, you know, upgrade the software to do certain 
things which at pre pre present we we can't do. There's a lot a lot of things that you might say you, that you'd like to do, uh, but we're not pro programmed to do. How, however, if you press the S key at any time, you're going to see that uh, the uh, two types of files, dot mat for matrix and dot s um, files uh, ha have slightly different formats, but they record the actual content of the simulated volume at that moment in time. And so any software that can then read that file, okay, and I, I can tell you what the header variables are and the layout of the file, and you can write any software to analyze it. For example, a, what I call bit function analysis has analyzed these files to determine the absolute zero Kelvin particle composition for the eight elementary particles, the electron, positron, and the six uh, quarks, uh, uh, three antimatter and three matter, uh, of, of what their actual particle composition is at zero Kelvin. Why is zero Kelvin? Uh, because you want to see what the particle composition is without other quanta in there which might indicate motion or heat going on. Hotspot, uh, oh, <laughs> there's a message that come co came up on, on closing the program. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, that's a little joke. You know, like if, if you run the program hotspot.execute, when you close it, little messages come up. <laughs> All right. So that, does that answer your question, question Bill? Um, right, so yeah. We, Bill? So we haven't done that yet. The other question is, can you in binary and mechanics? Excellent question, Bill. Excellent. Yeah, can, in uh, in binary mechanics, can you predict the emission spectra of hydrogen and helium? which NASA has measured and found many lines in the extreme ultraviolet and no previous theory of the atom has ever been able to explain any of the lines in the extreme ultraviolet for hydrogen and helium. Um, is there a way in binary mechanics you can um, predict the uh, spectra, spectra, emission spectra of uh, atoms? Well, with regard to predicting them, let's say we can observe them possibly with the simulator outputs, which are probably mostly hydrogen ions at low, low bit, hydrogen atoms or ions um, at, at, at the lo lower bit densities um, by looking at the spectrum output. One of the variables in the CSV file is called out bits. Those are the quanta that leave the simulated volume. There are three options in in the uh, simulator. One is called vacuum mode, where those bits that exit the simulated volume uh, are counted and are listed in that column of the output file. So that is the amount of quanta radiation coming out. And it's not constant. It varies. In other words, any frequency analysis program that you have can take that CVS file, read that data, and print out the spectrum. Now, the, the simulator itself, if you let it run long enough, prints out its own version of the spectrum on the left side. On the right side of the simulated volume shown on the screen that we saw, we have a histogram of the distribution of quanta. On the left side is my version of a spectrum analysis. Now, several years ago, maybe as many as five years ago, included in the hotspot.execute uh, uh, .zip uh, file is a um, frequency analysis of these output outbits. You can look at the outbits as the radiation coming out of the simulated volume, okay? And so that you can then look, look at that and, and produce a spectrum of it and several parameters, but I've dropped, I haven't worked on that, and so that's a very, if you look at the date on that file, it's probably many, many years old. I, I haven't had a chance to look at that right at the moment, but um, recently. But that is definitely on the agenda, so that there's no reason why we can't detect in those output files if the frequency analysis is done, 
or the spectrum analysis is done, uh, or Fourier analysis, if, if, you, if, if you will, um, on, on those output uh, bit uh, emissions, that all kinds of lines can be determined, okay? And um, it, it, it just requires someone to do it. I, I've been a busy little boy, <laughs> you know, and I've had on the docket to do that for a long time in terms of get, getting, for example, the Lyman lines and uh, for hydrogen, let's say, and, and the other ones. So, in, but I just haven't had time to do it. But anyone that downloads that pro program, if you run it long enough, <coughs> remember, one line of output in the CSV file is one BMLS simulator tick. That has four bit operations, which require uh, four, four, uh, the duration of which is four times the binary mechanics time constant, which is a very, very small number, which means that far many orders of magnitude below the attosecond level that experimentalists have available now. So the binary mechanics lab simulator opens up to investigators a whole domain of frequency and time intervals much smaller and microscopic than, than ever before av available to researchers. So in terms of getting like the spectral lines of say hydrogen or helium or what have you, um, I would think that you'd have to run the simulator a very large number of ticks even to get up to the attosecond level of, okay, maybe tens of thousands of ticks. So just start it running on the weekend while you go to the park and, and, and get a big output file and uh, load that into whatever frequency or Fourier analysis program you like uh, to get the lines and publish the results. Now, since the uh, binary mechanic time constant, uh, primary time constant, which I, is capital T um, in, in various pu pu publications, um, <clears throat> is so small okay uh it 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 means that lines which have not yet even been discovered at much higher frequency if, if you will uh can be uh, determined and so here uh anyone listening to they they can run a pr computer program and understand a little bit about spec spectral lines and know how how to do the analysis uh, or you can use my pro program if, if, if you want. That's included in the package. I forget what it's called. Uh, it's called Spectrum or something like, like that. And uh, <clears throat> ju just run all the EXEs in there, and you'll see what they do. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, can so can make this discovery. I mean, that's um, like a Nobel yeah. Prize right there. That's a Nobel Prize right there. Okay. Easy. Uh, I mean, w without even like breathing hard. And that's available to anybody listening today, or not listening, but looking at you later, uh, to do. So if you're interested in that kind of science, <laughs> I provided the tool for you. And then there's so many ingenious uh, people here today and watching, they're, they're gonna think of experiments that the simulator is not programmed yet to do. And, and hopefully you can email me or write me or something. And my email address is in the paper, Binary Mechanics, uh, um, which is the very first paper published on the journal website that Frank Franklin pointed out uh, a while ago, and uh, say, look, I'd like to do this experiment, but your software can't uh, enumerate certain things that I need to, to enumerate for my critical variables. Can we write this into it, or can we write a DLL which will handle that, or, or whatever, whatever? And I'll, I'll say, sure, let's go. Let's do it, because here we're, we can look at time domains uh, in terms of very short intervals, which have been uh, unavailable to science up to now. You know, we're, we're just, without that, we've just been set, set, setting back and saying, well, hundreds of thousands of oh, events are occurring, and <clears throat> we have no idea what they are. But now with the simulator, you can look and see what exactly they are. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time. There was this one question here from Robert K. And I said something about, uh, did he say the rotational space has a direction? 
what I was saying was that the uh, the right or left uh, circulation in the two wheels, I was calling them wheels, but we could call them sp spinning squares, okay, uh, to make Frank Franklin's uh, points uh, taken into account. Um, I was referring to them that there is uh, no, that either direction, which so surprised me, I thought there might be one direction that worked in one direction, or maybe the procession would be in the opposite direction, uh, the resulting procession, you know, if the rotation was right or left in the presentation I made, it was the same, which surprised the heck out of me, because this is all bra brand new stuff. I mean, nobody has done this. Lathworth uh, uh, doesn't say I'm spinning the wheel to the right or the left. He, he just starts to spin it, okay, in, in, in Lathwaite, I should say. At any rate, um, however, the absolute direction are the, the sum of the three vectors that I showed in those two tables, and like, which would be the net procession. And both for the proton bit cycle and the electron bit cycle, they are both negative, which indicates that if my spatial model is correct, there is a preferred direction, which encompasses, you might say, 90 degrees in, in uh, any way ar around that in the universe. And uh, now the challenge that I'm throwing out, uh, like the steady states in the game of civilization, by Sid Myers, you know the city states can, can throw out a challenge, you know, like m make a battleship or some, something like that. Well, here's my cha cha challenge: uh, show me the experiment or the observations which may already exist, which can establish or 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 at least are consistent with this hypothesis that I have proposed today of a universal, absolute direction. Of precession in the universe. Okay, well, it looks like we're getting towards the end of our time here. So uh, I'm just going to summarize a little bit. So uh, thank you, James, for your presentation. Thank and you for your patience and, and all we, of your uh, very good questions. I think we have a, an interesting idea of how you uh, conceive of of this uh, inertial motion and uh so we discussed we discussed that gotten a little bit detail on how your space works and uh we also uh looked at your uh, binary mechanics program on how to download it and uh how to run it and get it operating correctly so i was able to get it running on uh, my own system just while we while we were doing that so clearly that's uh, something that people can try out. And, uh, you know, James has invited people to uh, work with him on uh, things that he would like to simulate, or you can uh, go and get your own Nobel Prize um, by simulating some, whatever, whatever interests you apparently. So, so thank you, James, for that. And I think that will do it uh, for this episode of the Science Chat. All right. See you. See you next time. See um, yeah. See you next time, people. Thank you, Franklin. <laughs>